View from the Gutters, episode 75. Welcome to View from the Gutters, the comic book podcast where each episode we discuss a collected edition, trade paperback, or graphic novel, and then recommend and vote on the book for the next episode. Warning. The discussion portion of this show has massive spoilers for that book. On this episode, we discuss Universe X, and to skip ahead to the recommendation section, skip to 104.17. Can you both talk into the mic at the same time, like at the distance you guys are going to be at? Blah, 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 I'm talking about things and stuff, and I'm very angry because Joe is completely wrong. That should be fine. Actually, you're both wrong. That sounds great. Good Brent test is run, more guys. right than Toby is. Um, <laughs> do you know this is episode seventy five? Yeah, yes, it is. Did you know that? Yes, I made your check. Oh, wait, am, is this a thing? Are we going? I'm going now. Thing. Yeah, We're going. All right. <laughs> I am not to buy a pension. No, you're not. Who are you? I'm. I'm Joe Preddy. Stop! Stop <laughs> asking it like it's a question. I'm He's not, just reading it off the sure, teleprompter. Then you need to go. <laughs> Somebody who put the who put the question mark on the teleprompter? I am, in fact, Joe Preddy, the Joe Preddy, the man, the myth, the legend. Yes, that would I be me. am to buy a pension. Brant Gillahan Eddy, and I'm Cade Reynolds. Oh man, and th- we're talking about Universe X. Oh shit, X. It's, that not makes it extreme. Universe Triple X. If you yeah. read that, I'm sorry. <laughs> it was probably I'm hoping awful. that that's just like a slash fic of the Mr. Universe <laughs> that was uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger and Lou Ferrigno. Yeah, it's pretty bad. That's funny, because I was thinking that maybe it was slash fic of Triple X with Vin Diesel and or Ice Cube. Being in it's, a universe together. Yeah. <laughs> it's both of those things slash fic together. Yeah. Whoa. That's or joined at the penis, as it's, it were. It's actually Mega Man X, Professor X, slash fiction. Mm. X, X, X. Yeah, I got it. It's this cross is, slash fiction. This conversation is wrong on every level. <laughs> <laughs> so, Toby, you pitched this book. I did. Would you like to walk us through it? Sure. It um, uh, Quick question. Did yes. you reread Earth X before... Uh, I, or listen to our episode. I flipped through some of the end of Earth okay. X. I, I just read to the kind whole of re- thing. Refresh myself on it a little I bit. I should have done that. I, I think that there are certain <laughs> things that would have played better if I had read Earth X more recently than yeah. I have, but I still feel like I got the most out of it. Mm-hmm. And this, this book sits in a really interesting position for me because I really, really like this book. I mm-hmm. enjoyed the hell out of it. But I think that there is a very limited cross-section of people who are going to be able to read it and appreciate it. Partially because it is ponderously slow. Oh my god, is it dense. And so ridiculously dense. And really getting a lot out of it is predicated on having a certain level of understanding and appreciation for the Marvel Universe before you even go into or it. Or a lot of Wikipedia tabs open. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which a lot. is literally More what than I would your do. Browser I, I, can handle. I feel like I have a pretty good understanding of the Marvel Universe and even I was going, who the fuck is that character? Who the fuck is that character? There are literally two times while I was reading this that I was gonna call Eric Mannix but then remembered he was at work. Like, Oh, those are the ghost birds again. Um, the, They're real, I tell you, real! Apparently you can't hear them on the uh, on the recordings. But, um, yeah, there was like two different times where I was like, wait, this is an X-Men character. I should call Mannix, because I need to know more. <laughs> Who's the one that, uh, it's the, the Guardian of Limbo? Belasco. Belasco. Oh, yeah, I Belasco. Was gonna, I was going to ask if that's the same one that, like, imprisoned magic all those years. Yes. yes okay, cool. Is. Yeah, no, that's exactly who that is. <laughs> okay, cool. All right. Yeah, no, and this oh, wait, book is no, full of, like... No, it wasn't Belasco, it was Kurt Wagner. Oh, yeah. That, which brings up a whole oh, lot of weird... It. Like, this, this book is... Full of absolutely like ridiculous references. Even one of like the main people, uh, Kyle, whatever his last name is, With Richmond, the, Richmond, yeah, is Batman. Wait, really? Well, no. Yeah, he's uh. So in the Marvel universe, there's the squad, the Squadron Supreme, mm-hmm. 
which is full of basically oh, like copy Nighthawk. versions. Yeah, he's Nighthawk. Well, that's right. I, I did look that up. He's basically a copy of Batman yeah. who was in the Defenders like back in the 70s. The Secret Defenders or just the regular? No, just, no, just the, the regular Defenders. defenders. Right. We don't speak of the Secret Defenders yeah, here. That's not true. I talk about them all the time. Yeah. They're my favorite. And I hate you for You have that. better taste than Toby does. <laughs> well, but if you read <laughs> Twisted <laughs> Toy Fair Theater, you find out that every team ever invented is a part of Stephen Strange's Secret Defenders. I believe it. I thought that that was Nick Fury and his secret warriors. Nah, that's just secret that should just be one team. Right? Um, no, nah, yeah, I, I like that they bring up a bunch of defenders stuff in this book, actually. But yeah, um, like this, this is definitely a difficult book to read. There is page after page after page that is just narration boxes, mm-hmm. while. Like not even things that are happening, just like flashback scenes to things that exist is going on. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of people, like I could see that being a non-starter, but I was just like happy as a pig in shit going through. It's like, oh my God, it's this thing. And it's totally connected to this other thing. Yeah. And the Micronauts is a thing. And oh my God. So I, it was a fun like connect the dots of the Marvel universe. It's yeah. Like, it's like I, where's Waldo almost. I had a lot of fun with this book. Reading this book, have you ever put – every mm. once in a while I meet somebody that puts their peanut butter in the refrigerator, and especially when it's like the natural um, stuff. You have to refrigerate Adam's peanut butter. You do. No, that's true. No, that's I'm right. Just, so I'm like, just saying. But when that one's sealed, out, Cade. <laughs> it's very – It's it's been – I mean, peanut butter is pretty dense shit as it is, and it's really hard. It's like – it's almost like butter, and so you make a sandwich out of it, and it rips the shit out of your bread. And then you eat it and you have to chew it like They make they fill it full of junk that makes it like stable at room temperature. You gotta get some better peanut butter, man. I'm no, I'm You're messing up his metaphor. (laughs) He's trying to say I'm just saying I know a lot about peanut butter. (laughs) If I ever have a peanut butter question, you're my guy. New from new from View the Gutters charged peanut butter hour. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, that's this week week we review. Uh, it's all oh, it should be like this it should be like Leonard's YouTube channel oh my God. Uh, from Community. Thank you for bringing that up. Oh it God. wasn't me this time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this week on the Peanut Butter Hour, oh uh, Peter Pan. Peanut so butter. many, so many peanut butters. So little uh, time. But anyways, you make a sandwich out of it. It's been in the fridge. It's really like it just rips the dense. shit out of your it rips Wonder the Bread. Shit out of your fucking Wonder Bread, and then mm-hmm. you have to chew it for like an hour, and like and it gets stuck only, to the roof of your mouth. And it gets stuck to the roof of your mouth. The only reason you're gonna like that is if you love peanut butter, and that was that's my experience. Wow. That was a long. <laughs> that's metaphor. what reading this book is like. It really is. It's like a comic book, but like three comic books in every one issue. It's basically Jim Kruger's doctoral thesis on comic. Books. It absolutely is, <laughs> and it really is. on the Marvel Universe. On actually, the future of the Marvel Universe, putting all these, and while. I picked it up and I'm like, I don't fucking believe I have to read this. I was like, there's no way I'm going to read Earth X again because that's also incredibly dense. And like, I enjoy the shit out of Earth X. And I remembered it kind of well enough to to kind of get through this. And I mean, I do. I love this book. I own it. Uh, Brant actually gave it to me. Um, Oh, man. And it is incredibly well written. Like the amount of plot holes that you would think would exist in a world they're like non-existent oh, yeah. like he covers he just covers, about everything and i would say too much even there's because... a but there's a reason if you think about it if you go back and you look i was just trying to triple check this it's all written by the same guy yeah, yeah. no absolutely everything even the the uh, add-ons yeah right all by the same guy now there's a couple of writers who help do some of the lifting on some of the add-ons, uh, Beasts, I believe, has an additional writer. Yeah. But Jim Kruger does it all. Oh, now, yeah. Alex Ross helped. And if you've read about how Earth-X came to be, there, there's some... Yeah, he, he talks in one of the ancillary issues in the back matter about long, long phone conversations with Alex Ross. Right. But uh, I remember reading, and I wish I could have found it before the episode. There was basically an article written that was like, "This is a this isn't a once in a lifetime event. This is a once in an industry event. Yeah. You're never going to see someone else, or you probably won't see one person basically be given access to every single thing in the universe and be allowed to do whatever they basically want to do with them." Oh, absolutely. Like, love it or hate it, 
this guy did exactly what he wanted to do from beginning to end over, what, 50-some-odd issues of comics total, I think, if you count all the add-ons, Omnibuy, sketchbooks. And the add-ons are double-length. They're like 50 pages each. Right. Even the sing- the regular issues are like more like 30 pages than right. a 22-page yeah, no, they're... comic. Like this is There's a lot of stuff going on, and I totally agree with Brent. And in a lot of ways, this, I think, is kind of the perfect Elseworlds story. I, I would absolutely agree with that. He, he's building a world out of a world that's familiar to you with characters that are familiar to you. And he's taking them to places that they'll never get the chance to go inside a contained universe in which every author has to kind of put the toys back in the box. Like, he's not going to be able to have um, Machine Man like rip the ears off of Watu like in the main universe because like they need a Watu. Like, even if they're going to kill him in an event. They're going to bring him back. There's always going to be a Watcher. And having that legacy like pass on to other characters in an Elseworlds story is really interesting. So, And each character was thoughtfully planned out. Oh, yeah. I mean, like, even a character that's mentioned twice, Hawkeye, had four arms. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, every single character had uh, some detail added. Yeah, well, it really it's... felt like time had passed. Yeah. And that the events that had shaped like something that I found really interesting about reading this this time was how many of the events that happened in this book have now since happened in the Marvel universe. Like specifically the most recent one, the Terrigen mist bomb. If you read was, I don't remember what it was called. It was infinity. Was it infinity? No, it was inhumanity. Wasn't it? Inhumanity came after infinity. When they blew up the Terrigen mist, black bolt blows up the Terrigen mist. It covers the world and it's like activating all of these inhumans that were living on earth. Uh, straight out of this book, basically. But something that I really appreciate about what this book did with that was it went the full measure with it. It was like, it's not only affecting some people. It's like everyone now has superpowers. And, and that's one of the things that's mutations. great about Elseworlds is that you have the ability to like demo ideas and try things yeah. and then go, that was awesome. We're going to refine that a little bit and we're going to do it for real in the main book. Oh, yeah. And like reading this... EarthX and um, Kingdom Come get compared a lot, mm-hmm. and I think that there's that, that's justly done. Yeah, and well, I think of those two, I like Kingdom Come a little bit more. It ha- kind of has a more dynamic story. Yeah, but where Kingdom Come leaves off is where Universe X picks up, and it reminded me of Crisis on Infinite Earths to ex- an extent. Oh, it yeah. reminded me of Watchmen. It reminded me of a lot of the things that Grant Morrison has done in terms of treating the comic book universes as universes that existed within comic books. Mm -hmm. And I think that Universe X outdoes them all. And it takes it to a level that no one else has approached. And like you said, I don't think anybody else is going – or no, it was Brant who said no one else is going to do – what Jim Kruger did in this book again. I don't know. Not for many years. I don't don't know that that anyone will get the chance even. I don't know that anybody could – well, I, I mean, mean like, it, I mean, it the feels like the he... amount of research he must have put into sure. this. The... But I mean, like, Crisis on Infinite Earths was no different. There was just like That's there were right. researchers. There was tons of research went into that. Kingdom Come, same thing. But like Brant said, you know, like they gave him three huge books to explore that universe. Yeah. Fun fact. Apparently, well, it's two fun facts, right? I don't know how much you guys talked about this in Earth X. I mean. Kingdom Come and Earth X get compared a lot because Earth X was created specifically in response to Yeah, Kingdom it was a Cat. wizard article. It was a wizard was article, like, basically like, Alex Ross, do this to Marvel. Yeah, what so, would you do if you had the chance if to, you had do a to chance Marvel? to do it to Marvel? But the other thing is is that this was originally there was an argument that this was in continuity. Yeah. And it, it was clarified in Paradise X, which is the next book or series. That this is actually an alternative Earth. Right. And originally when he wrote Earth X, it was supposed to be the future of right. the 616. It now has its own Earth de- designation, which is like 999. I think it's 978 or something like it's, that. Or, I don't know. Yeah, I was reading the Wikipedia. 99916, I think. I don't know. I was reading it earlier. It's I've a big forgotten one. forgotten already. Anyway. 867 yeah, 309. Like, and I think that because cont- time passed in the mainstream continuity and things got retconned and like things were changed, it could no longer possibly be the future. Right. Um, but like Kingdom Come, it was originally designed as in, hey, this is a possible future for DC. And, yeah. you know, Earth X was a possible future for Marvel. And they're both very dystopian in their... Well, like you said, they both, they both left oh, the... I dystopian. I don't know how you say that word. It's dystopian. Dysutopia. 
This, this I swear to God, this. I will smack you. Fruitopia. No, you yeah, won't. That's because you'd have to get up, go all the way across <laughs> the so room. There's so many mics and mic cables. <laughs> um, but yeah, like it. This book, to an extent, feels like somebody sitting down and writing a story bible for the Marvel universe, where they tie everything together. But yeah. instead of it just being like a secret thing that only editors and writers are allowed to read, they kind of turned it into a story and put it out there. And it's been this thing that other writers could mine yeah. and have used for the last 15 years now yeah. for inspiration. And so a lot of these things, the things that you see have come to pass or at least inspire, could easily be seen as inspiring things that are going yeah. on. Bobby Drake is the most powerful mutant in the world. Right. Yeah, and the, it's it's funny it? that this came out like right around the same time as Avengers Forever, and Avengers yeah. Forever is referenced in it, and it's doing a similar thing in terms of going back into the history of the Marvel universe and putting things into a specific context and continuity. But this just goes so much farther than even Avengers Forever did. Yeah, well, it's also a lot more dense than it Avengers is. That was, <laughs> Which is well, it's exactly. thing, thing, so yeah. Was kind of something I wanted to bring up was just like there's so much information flying in your face in this book that sometimes I feel like some things are very over explained. Like there could be a little bit more mystery left to it, but hearing Toby kind of describe it as like this alternate universe, but also story Bible, like makes a lot of that feel more necessary. So I don't know. There were also those things that were like way under explained. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's some mystery left to the story. Like, for example, um, well, I guess it's, they become revealed over time. So I have not read Paradise X yet. So I imagine that some other things will become Uh, explained. Just like at the end of Earth X. Well, I'm talking about things like when uh, Captain Marvel kills the Supreme Intelligence. Right. Like, that's first mentioned in an appendix in issue seven saying that this is something that will be talked about in a flashback in issue nine. And then there's like a, one of the side issues that references it, but you don't know what happened. And then later in issue nine, you see the aftermath of Marvel having killed the Supreme intelligence, but it's this weird kind of like circuitous thing where they're triangulating around an event that they never actually show you. Wait, the Supreme intelligence, like the Kree, the face. Yeah. The, the Supreme war. They totally show that. Yeah, they do. Show yeah. It. They show him getting he, smashed he with a hammer. Thor's hammer. Yeah. To he yeah. Busts the jar open. It just, it, it felt really weird. That was one of my favorite moments. In like the the, there were a number of moments where it felt like he was describing something as having happened that you weren't explicitly being shown. That's fair. Well, and I think that's one of the... I mean, to me, that's something I really appreciate about this is because you're not given... a Like, the frame of reference that you receive is given to you as you experience the text. You're experiencing it as Kyle is. And he doesn't know when things are happening. So, like... At first, it's kind of odd. You're trying to, like, establish a timeline, and then you realize that may not be the most fruitful thing to do. Like, what, just kind of read, pay attention to things, file things away, and and kind of, like, trust that you're going to be kind of shown what happened. Because, yeah. like, I remember reading that part and going, uh, okay, so, like, because I'd already read it, I knew what happened, but I was like, they must not have shown, they didn't show that yet. So I'm assuming they're going to talk about that in the future because Marvel, like Kid Marvel is running around doing stuff that, and that's kind of like out of sync with how Kyle is talking about him doing stuff yes. at several points. Mm. And like that's, it's disorienting, but I think, I feel like I mean, that kind of adds it's to sort it. of intentional in the yeah. narration, but... I, I totally agree that it can be really disarming. And I also, there's stuff that's just not explained that I don't know if there's going to be an answer to. At the end of Earth X, when Galactus takes off his helmet and is Franklin Richards, I was like, what the fuck? And I didn't read Universe X for like a year. And now in Universe X, I like sort of understand why that happened. But there's still like that, mo- a lot of that has not been like the, I guess the intention of that and the reason, quote unquote, behind that has still not. Well, well, no, they they Uh, kind of explain explain it. Reed Richards turns Galactus into a star. Mm -hmm. Then they find out about the Celestial at the core of the planet. They need Galactus 
but they don't have Galactus. And Reed knows that Franklin has reached the third level of mutation and can become anything he wants. Oh. So he has Black Bolt call him and he says, you are Galactus. And Franklin becomes Galactus. That's why in the beginning when Machine Man is talking to him, he's like stammering and hemming and hawing because what he's trying not to say is, you're Franklin Richards. Because mm. he knows the minute he says you're Franklin Richards, he will cease to be Galactus and he will be Franklin Richards And who Richards gives again. him, who like, Turns him into Galactus. That because I read that part. It was Reed. Uh, Reed does. Yeah, I don't know. It's, well, it's Reed and Black Bolt. Yeah, they're but there's all like... like there's a celestial being that shows up that like gives him the Galactus stuff. No, they show him there in like Doom's castle with the Galactus armor, and then he like goes up into space. It's toward the end. I don't know. I read. I was reading it, and I was just like, I don't know what's going on with this. And of course, I have to like find the part where that and actually happens. And the stuff happens. about Thor is also at the end of Universe X as talked about in Paradise X. I've read the first issue of Paradise X and Iron Man 2099 is in it or I think it's Iron Man 2099 and he's got this really weird design and... I don't know that there was ever an Iron Man 2099. It's it's the futuristic Iron Man. Is it Arno Stark, the Iron Man of 2020? That's what it is. Yes. Iron Man is dead in this one. So We... Yeah, I I wanted to say I loved the uh, color changes of the Avenging Host in this book. Oh, the uh, uh, the photo negative costumes. Yeah, oh, yeah, in the Realm of the Dead, because like the green and purple uh, Iron Man armor was awesome. Well, that's, you had the even Thanos looks like weird. He's yeah. got a yeah. totally different color now. Well, that is that's actually photo negative, right? That's the yeah. that's the inverse to all their mm-hmm. col- their normal colors, which I thought was really cool because the world is the opposite. Of... That would make sense. Yeah, there were a lot Captain of Captain America's in this book. reminded me a lot of Aquaman, but I dug it. Dude, that fucking moment where he comes up and he's got the old shield. Oh yeah. And they're like Yeah. I really love the moment when the reject shows up. At like the army with the army of uh, the freakish looking people, like we want to be human again, and everybody's going like, "You look awesome. Why did you? Why would you want that?" Yeah. And that, this is actually a character that showed up in Jack Kirby's original Eternals yeah. miniseries, which I read earlier this year, and so I was like, "Oh, that character's sweet." So I had a question for you guys. In the realm of the dead, um, there is Nova. And then another guy, and then Quasar. And girl. Marvel. That was Miss Marvel. Yeah, yep. yeah. she's Cameron. dead at the okay. time. That well, they she's were. not dead. They're They're no, none of them the are. Negative zone. Yeah, none of them are dead. They're all in <laughs> yeah. the negative zone in a coma. Yeah. In Marvel Comics, though, at this time, hadn't they taken Miss Marvel back out of? You know, I'm not sure. She had so yeah. many status changes yeah. between being Miss Marvel yeah. and being binary and out in space yep. and yada yada yada. I don't think that she was Ms. Marvel at right. this time. Okay. No, because I think at that point, Carol Danvers was kicking around as Ms. Marvel. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just not sure. Yeah, I don't know. But the only... I will say this. Quasar was a tough one. You had to look at the quantum band on his wrist. <laughs> yeah. It took, like, me the, it took me the longest time to figure out who he was. Oh, I was wondering I who just the girl the was. I fact that, you know, yeah. like... Because I couldn't tell if that was a lightning bolt on her chest or if it was a an S. Yeah, it was the lightning bolt. I mean, they were it was funky, and they're never referred to by like even in the appendix, they're not referred to by name. Yeah. yeah. So yep. I read it. Well, one in of the them Wikipedia was referred article. to as Bob, and I couldn't figure out well, who that was. Um, uh, Quasar, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. Quasar is Bob. Yeah. For a moment, I was like, "Is that the Sentry?" But the Sentry wasn't a thing yet. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Did, Did anybody catch? Uh, the Howard the Duck reference. Oh yeah, absolutely. I thought that was hilarious. I didn't, uh, because it's actually. implied that the beast ate Howard the Duck. Oh, that somebody ate Howard the Duck. Yeah. Anyways, uh, it's in Universe X Beasts where he, and, uh, Hank yeah. is talking, and he's like, "I still feel bad about Howard." Yeah, and I actually really enjoyed the side issues in this series. Like a lot of times, the one shots are just kind of like eh, but I really loved a lot of them, especially the. Spider-Man one. I was gonna ask because I didn't read those this time. I read I the didn't. I read the prequel issue, um, and I read the the epilogue issue, um, but I did not read Spiders of Beast. Do they explain more about the Spider Guy? Spiders Man. Yeah. 
sort of okay. like if you read the appendix and the ancillary material like he's just a guy who was mutated by the Terrigen mists and happens to look like Spider-Man's costume. I looked him up on Wikipedia and he's only in this. That's the weirdest thing. <laughs> that that character is one of the ones where it's just like, man, I do not know what's going on with that guy. Yeah, yeah. I think some of it is a response, right? Like Alex Ross made certain things and then Kruger's having to come back and be like, this is what this guy is. Yeah, no, for you sure. Know, especially like after the initial run because Ross, I don't think, comes back as a... He does the covers, but I don't think he does any of the story. No, he is credited back, for story. Is, is he? Credited yeah, on this no, one. And in the appendix to the trades we have, he talks about how he's like, you know, he's kind of like saying... You may love this or hate this. Like we did everything we did in this book, oh, yes, yes. and out of every book that we've done in Earth X, Universe X, and Par- and eventually Paradise X, we've done it out of love, out of love for the Marvel universe and the characters. And I mean, like if you're talking about fucking like the Enigma Force and Captain Universe, there's a Marvel Universe joke in this, which mm. is hilarious. Uh, the guys that kill Captain America. I mean, like, this is some arcane shit, man. This it is really not... is. Well, sort of. It's arcane to us. Yeah. It's not arcane to them. Now, no. think about us. Like, if one of us sat down to write our grand thing of the Marvel Universe, we might talk about the secret Avengers and the great conspiracy yeah. and Avengers disassembled. Like, we would have plenty of quote-unquote arcane shit to throw in there. It would just right. be a symbol of our time and energy spent. I, no, I agree. I mean, that's and total, fair, you know, but when did this come out? Early. 2000 yeah yeah and like a lot of those characters are from the 70s right but i'm willing to wager that jim kruger was reading oh i'm and sure Alex he Ross was, was, but... was reading in the 70s I mean, like the... i'm just saying i'm uh, just saying it's an ex- it's not as inaccessible to the people who wrote it i guess it's our I'm, I'm not saying it's in our in, i'm not saying it's necessarily inaccessible i'm talking about the characters he's using that's it's like if you want to talk about talking about Avengers Disassembled, you can. But Avengers Disassembled, I'd be willing to to it, say reached a larger, a much much larger audience. It but it feels like audience. there's no part of the Marvel universe that he's not touching in some way. Yeah, and that's yeah. like, and that is impressive. That, well, but every year that goes by, this does become more arcane to right. yeah. future sure. readers, and I think that it's it's a testament to the author and. The um, I mean, like the co-writing team that they had, which was a lot of this stuff, although I never read those comics and have no idea what that is. The story is still accessible, regardless if you're catching all of the tiny like, accessible, details. assuming you're willing to put in the time and energy to read it. Well, that's, yeah, I mean, yeah. well, but I mean, that's an important barometer of accessibility. Like true. this. I mean, it's this is it doesn't hard... read itself. Yeah. Yeah, it's not. So there there was actually one part that I was confused about, and I'm wondering if anybody can clear it up for me. So in the Zero issue, like at the very mm-hmm. beginning, when they're kind of talking about all the different events that have gone on, and they talk about the Infinity Gauntlet, and there's this two-page spread where they're talking about uh, the champions who had faced Thanos, and they list the Silver Surfer, Ms. Marvel, Nova... Star Lord, Captain Universe, and her. And mm. like half those people were not there in the Infinity Gauntlet. And there's also somebody on the page in the background who is pictured but not named. Captain who has Comet. Captain Comet. There you go. Well, and I'm like, what is what is going on with this page? Like they're talking about the Infinity Gauntlet, but those are not the people. Yeah, I think that this is their version of the Infinity Gauntlet. And this ah. is what the commentary about the Paradise X Earth revision is, is that Kruger changed things to fit certain little oh, Kruger and Ross fit things to fit their narrative and to right. give people connections in certain circumstances. And that's ultimately what led to the decision to make to declare it as an alternative earth. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's fair. And the big revelation in paradise X is that, is that that whole thing about it being the whole editorial decision to make it a different earth is actually paired with a revelation in paradise X that the year is actually 2003 in paradise X. Which is what actually then ties it together as being a different world. Because, of course, the implication had been that this was the far future of the Marvel Universe when, in fact, it actually is now. Right. As of the time of its Everyone writing. just decided to grow beards. Yeah. Well, that's how you For know fun. it's the future. That's how you know it's the- alternative future. No, it's just know. alternative present, man. We got beards. Oh, well, yeah. Do I love King, uh, what is it, King Britain? Yeah. His oh, yeah. fucking oh, costume yeah. redesign with his beard. I love that. 
<clears throat> so many good costume redesigns in this. Yeah, there's place. a lot of interesting choices. I think that I'll, even if you are having a hard time reading this book, and I, I totally 100% agree with Toby on this, though. I'm not sure whose hands I would put this in. There's like a slim group of people that would be like, you know what book you're going to fucking love more than anything else is going to be Universe X. Like, yeah, I feel like right? it's slim. It's there, though. There are yeah. definitely people I would be like, hey, read a couple of things first. Well, I mean, I think that the, 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 the enthusiasm that brought the people who are making this show into the same room yeah. manifests in, in a, you know, in that certain chunk of people. Right. I mean, the whole reason I ended up reading this book in the, and I put it in the hands of some of the people in this room was because... You've got some people who read a story and are just kind of like, oh, that's a story. Mm-hmm. Or they're like, oh, I get confused by this thing and I don't, you know, and I kind of don't care. But there's occasionally that reader, and this is true in comics, but in other things, who want to be like, I want to know more about this obscure thing that they mentioned. Because that yep. sounds really cool. And when you meet a fellow reader who's like, I like this kind of weird stuff that's going on in the background. I want to know more. It's like, well, then you might you might be initiated into our little secret cult here. The, right. the well, X-series cult. You know? It's the mentality that goes... I don't recognize this guy in the background of this panel, and he's not named. Who is he? Why is he there? Why is that important? It's yeah. the kind of thing that makes you want to call Eric Mannix or open 400 Wikipedia tabs. <laughs> Wikipedia pages. Because yeah. I'm the same way. It's like I, I like to read the story to the best of my understanding, meaning that if I don't understand something that's going on, I very rarely will I just skip it and go, no. Nope. Moving on. There's stuff that I get confused about, and even when I try to figure it out, I'm like, I still don't get it. Yeah, I mean, this this but, really is like the Cimmerillion of comic books. <laughs> I, no, I, I was looking for a, I was looking for a connection, and yeah, that's it. That's fair. Really, really you know, is. But there's there's not a whole lot of people who are going to appreciate it, but those who do are going to get a lot out of it. Man, I have a friend who likes the Cimmerillion more than they like Lord of the Rings. Oh yeah, those people are out there. There's a lot yeah. less hobbits and weirdos, man. That's a big, I mean, that's cool a big tick up. <laughs> I mean, the the thing to me is that at the end of the day, it's difficult to read, but it's incredibly rewarding to read because I think very few. I I, I really this is this was an epic vision. This 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 was not like oh I have this really cool idea to do this with Captain America. This yeah. was like this is my vision for a, a unified Marvel universe that explains these huge questions in a way that's like not been approached before. And when you get through it, I think you're rewarded with a really well put together. And it really is amazing how he just puts everything together. Yeah, like it's like watching well, him build he a has puzzle. The, I mean, like this is again, this is an alternate universe earth. This is an alternate history right. story. This it, is an else world. So when something doesn't fit, he just changes it. Right. Yeah. And that's the thing Which to keep I in mind love. is that ultimately the reason it all fits together so well is because he cheats and makes it fit. I love but, that. Uh, but there that's, are, there's a lot that's to that's like the, about that. That's there's, the beauty of the else world though, right? Yeah, yeah, and it's also the fact that that's I mean, I appreciate that distinction at the same point for every one person that's going to make the cheat and make that oh, yeah, change. Some people, there's no, fucking ten that are going to be like nobody will notice. I'll just leave it that way. Well, my yeah. ba- my my favorite thing. There's a couple in Paradise X that are actually pretty cool. My favorite thing in all of the series is Reed Richards bending his brain yes. to use Cerebro. Yes. Yeah. Who the hell never thought of that before? You know what I mean? Like yeah. these guys got in a room and were like, you know, let's think about this. This guy can basically bend any part of his body. Why wouldn't he do something like that? And yeah. it's like, oh. I never thought about that. I like in this that they talk about Bobby Drake be actually being the single most powerful mutant. And, of course, the way they present it, you're like, yeah, that actually makes complete sense. Mm-hmm. There's nothing about that that is not real. Yeah. yeah. Like, and I mean, and that's shown up in the comics. I mean, at this point now, since this series came out, Bobby Drake has basically become a being of pure ice. He's been broken. He's been destroyed. He's been shattered. I mean, they've done everything to him. He's caused large scale you know, weather pattern stuff. Like we've seen alternate universe Bobby Drakes be even cooler than yeah. the six one six Bobby Drake. Yeah, that, like stuff in Uncanny X Force. Yeah, and I think a lot of that probably is a head nod to at least absolutely. some of the ideas that got thrown. Oh, in abso- here. no, absolutely. So, well, I mean, there was. I remember reading some books in the nineties, some X Men books, where they like bring up the fact that he's an Omega level mutant. Yeah, right around right, right, right around the time of Onslaught, and I hate to bring up yeah. Onslaught. Like that <laughs> was the why? point where his like so chest good. got it's shattered, important. and he was like for. A few months, he was like, I, I can't change back to human because I'll die. Mm-hmm. And eventually, like, he gets forced into it. And he's like, oh, I'm, I'm still alive. That's weird. I guess my powers don't work the way I thought they did. Right. Maybe I'll have to think well, about that there, in five or ten years. there have been, like, references to it 
even before that, like Mikhail I, yeah. Rasputin, <laughs> when, like runs into him as he's busting out of like where they're holding him, and Bobby Drake is standing guard, and he's like, "You have no idea how powerful you are. Yeah. If you help me, I will show you." I think Ooh. Sinister should, talks about it too. It's to be boring. fair, though, I do want to point this out. That has been said of a vast majority oh, of no, the X-Men. Absolutely. At some point, Sinister or Magneto or somebody yeah. comes up and says, like, you know, you're Skin, yeah. you are actually one of the most powerful <laughs> mutants. And you're like, what? But then somebody comes along and says, well, it turns out that Skin can do this thing. You know, like Chamber, you know, was right. another good example. It turns out he's got a star in his mouth. I mean, you know, it's <laughs> so, so, and I mean, and that's the whole thing, right? Like, I think, I think the thing that was impressive about Kingdom Come and the thing that's impressive about Earth X is that both teams and this is true of a lot of other series are very good masons right they take bricks of things that have been established before they've got a very solid sense of how to lay them out and how to bind them together to make a very nice wall yep my one caveat is that this this story is rewarding if you like a certain kind of story yeah i think ultimately i come back there's one thing that I have to say before I forget is I find Universe X discombobulating because for me, Earth X was a total package. The art influenced a very particular flavor for me yes. about how that world looked, just like how Ross's art in Kingdom Come create, creates a very specific tone and taste. And so it changes. Braithwaite's style is much more clean. In some ways, that's a lot better because there's so many visual references and redesigns and stuff. Yeah. I shudder to think having to take that because EarthX had a lot of those characters, but not nearly as many and so many different things and as many flashbacks because this whole thing is about looking at the past in a certain way. So I'm I'm thankful in a certain sense that Braithwaite is doing the art because it's like I never would have been able to fucking tell it was Ca- Captain Comet with the other guy necessarily. Right. But it did make it. It is disjointing for me, especially because I think the way that Earth universe and paradise x are laid out is much more as a contiguous story and so it's very jarring to go from act one to act two with a you know i mean it would be like spielberg literally throwing you know taking the reel off and throwing up something else and being like here you go guys you'd be like what what what?" yeah and like expected to still have the same emotional tone to it but i think they do a good job i mean it is a different story too it It is is meant to have a different emotional tone but i i'm with you for a different reason though i think i'm i i find earth x more of a complete package because it feels like it has a beginning middle and end yes where a lot of this story feels like it's only middle yeah one of my big problems with this story is that they take the like two characters talking about things from like a distant view and they double that. Yes. So you now have X-51 and Uatu talking, and you have Kyle Richmond and Isaac the Gargoyle talking. Yes. Right. Uh, Isaac Christensen. So you have both of those things happening. Yes. And then in the middle between that, you have Child Marvel and Captain America kind of wandering around grabbing stuff, but there's no like real central antagonist that they're fighting against, like they're fighting against Kang and Immortus in Avengers Forever. Well, like they, there's no there's they, no central thing that they're like they're attacking and they're being repelled. Well, like there's not, no there's no build. They're not fighting it with with an army like they right. are in Earth X. Like they are there to prevent what Pope Amortis is doing. Right, but it's kind of like them going from place to place, right. interacting with people, having small conflicts, but not really building up to anything. Yeah. And then at the same time, you have all the other groups of people like Reed Richards. In Latveria and Marvel in the Land of the Dead and King Britain and what's going on there and the stuff with Spider Man in New York. Like, you have all of these different little brush fires that aren't really building for a long time. It's yeah. just kind of stuff is happening and people are talking. It's a continuation of a story. Right. And then at the very end, it all kind of smashes together really yep. quickly. Yeah. No, yeah. I have that problem too, especially if you skip the prelude issue. Yes. Which. I totally did because I was like, "Oh, Paradise X number one. Let's start here." Wrong. Like there is a zero issue, and uh, read that because it's it is actually yeah, I mean, really, issue one. Read the whole thing. Like yeah, don't, in the trade, don't it's go, in order. Yeah, don't go like, "Oh, this is a one shot about yeah. Spider Man." That's not important. Like no. those things are very organic to the story, yeah. and you need to read them to really understand and the whole in thing. In the trade, are they all collected in that order? They are. Yes. Cool. Yes. Which is why I'm glad I have them. I mean, they did, Marvel usually does a 
pretty good job of like throwing that stuff. Yeah. Together. There and is, there is one other thing that really bothered me about this series. Mm. And that is that Sue Storm and oh, Eve are both like hugely deprotagonized. Like yep. they're just kind of, they're damseled. Well, they're, they're there to be threatened for men to either seek or protect them. I think that it's funny that uh, Sue is like unfridged in this story. Like, she's brought back from the dead to do literally nothing. nothing yeah. yeah. That's, like, that's the thing. She's like, there to be a damsel. Like, she's, she's there not, for Reed to protect her. It's less It's less even damseling. It's just, like, she's there to be girlfriend. Yeah, like, because she's she, never really in any, like, she's in danger on, like, three pages. She's in, in danger of Reed not loving her as much as he did in the previous panel. Exactly. <laughs> like, that's it. That's, like, all that's happening is he's like, I love you, Sue. And it's like, yeah, no, I, I was dipping. I, I, I got it, man. I, I and, get you love me. And it's going cool. back to what Brant was saying, like, one of the changes that he makes is talking about her mm -hmm. eve also known as kismet uh as though she was created created for adam warlock right and if you read the original story she was actually a second adam warlock mm -hmm. who was created and then said like oh well there was already an adam so i'm going to make myself be female and i'm gonna go find him but she was always like his equal right and she was never created for him yeah, and also he was like in that weird hibernation thing, right? When she went to go look for him, that's how Infinity Gauntlet starts, right? Am uh, I confusing yes. that with a different? Yeah, story I think I think that you're uh, confusing that. That was much earlier, and at the time he was like off in space or something. Oh, like okay. That. Like she goes to look for him in Counter Earth, and they're like, "Oh, he died." Oh, and okay, she just assumes exactly that he's dead. About, yeah. This is the Great Starlin Saga. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, and uh, the other thing about. Sue was the best thing that happened to her in this series, I think. Her confrontation with Doom happens after she's dead. And so they didn't have to bring her back for that moment to happen. Yeah. Like that moment happened in the other world, the dead world, like yeah. regardless. I think she would have been much better used in the land of the dead as like a general of the and armies also, of the dead. Yeah, she totally could have fought in the end of the time. Like until she's re resurrected, she's a badass because right. like everybody's trying to kill me and they fucking can't because yeah. I'm Sue fucking Storm. I do like the moment between Namor and her. Namor? S Namor. And, but uh, only sort of. Like I feel like it's cool, but everyone does that moment. Yeah. So. Well, I mean, this is one of those ways in which comics has accelerated very dramatically. And, and even this a particular stripe of this conversation has hyper accelerated in the last 18 months, which is mm. progressivism in comics. I mean, mm -hmm. this is still very much, you know, women are secondary or tertiary characters. Most of the main figures, I guess you can find your token you yeah, know, character, I mean, this is female a boys character. Club. But, girls, no girls allowed. But there is not as much... Uh, opportunity for the characters that are feminine to shine no it's it you're definitely right and as someone who's like on top of the 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 world of academia as far as comic book discussions go like i think you've probably seen even more than we have the discussion accelerate in the last oh, yeah. few years well i mean it's i mean i mean it's such a i mean video the between the video game thing and just some of the general stuff that's happened in the geek community it's just it's a lot more common and i mean you can go i mean i mean and i'm talking about like the vast majority of my knowledge at this point is the fact that i have a rss feed reader that dumps a hundred and some odd links to me a day from right. you know bleeding cool and all these mm -hmm. other comics things like this is not not a bunch of academics sitting in a corner somewhere this is a lot of just no but i bet when you were doing a lot more of your academic graduate work like this discussion was not Oh yeah, there at all? No, I mean not as much, but that's because the I mean comics tend to be the mo most comics conversation is mainstream comics conversation, right? Like there are alternative comics where yeah. these things are less of an issue, but those just don't have the same kind of forum as right. pop culture, stock and trade, comic book websites, and so insert shout out to the outhazers, yeah, on which we are syndicated, yeah. I also feel that some of it is generational. Oh, absolutely. I think like, that's a I mean that's that, that's a big thing that comes up in conversations about race, sex, you know, 
like I mean, even political polling basically says if you're under, I think, 35 or under 40, like the split between who thinks gay marriage should be legal is some ridiculously inverse proportion to the people who are over 60 who think it's appropriate. Like generational divide. I mean, a lot I mean, of us who are younger just do not care. We've, well, I, mean, I also mean that in in this now digital age, the generational gaps are uh, shortening. Like, I feel that, like, some 20, like, 24-year-olds who would normally have different opinions because of the way that the information is spread these days, younger people can have access to the same. I think really what you're driving at is a totally different argument for a different day, but is that no no i don't want to just like dismiss it like that but is that is the anonymity of the internet creating like these false generational ideas because i when someone tell talks on the internet and is like man women shouldn't be allowed in comics and it's anonymous i don't know what generation they're from so as a defender of comics like i don't feel like i can just go ah well he's old so he thinks in an old generation so like it's up to other people to go you know what you i disagree with you i think that comics is for everyone and that there's more of a dialogue being taking place granted a lot of that dialogue is just shouting but at least the dialogue is happening now where when your grandma says something racist you're more likely to just go like "Mm, she's from a different time like the anonymity i think makes you like watching uh they were just talking about this on the Game Grumps episode I was watching before I left the house today. Is about it about Ross's, how Danny's old as fuck? No, like, Ross's grandma. Well, yeah, he is old as fuck, by which you mean he's my age. <laughs> uh, which is really weird, because he'll make references that nobody else I know make will make, and I'll be I'll get them, and I'm like, oh my god, I'm old. But, uh, no, uh, Ross's, Ross's grandma. racist. But, um... No, I think it's, I, I think it's that, that anonymity, though. No, I I agree. I don't think it's just but anonymity. Discussion. I think that, I mean, I think the discussion is happening right now, yeah. and the discussion is getting bigger, despite the fact that there are people on the periphery of the discussion that are screaming and are desperately clinging to a way of life that is rapidly diminishing. Well, there there are those people who do not want that conversation to happen. Yeah, yes. and they. That that's just that's not going to happen. Like this yeah. conversation didn't happen I mean, whether the they want it to or not. Yeah, and it's well, the conversation guess, in and of itself is becoming, I feel, more fruitful recently, especially in the last eighteen months. I think. Although, I'm seeing a lot more. I'm seeing a lot less articles that are like, "This is what it means to be feminist. This is why feminism isn't a bad word, and this is why we need it." And this, these are the examples of fridging and blah blah blah. And I'm seeing a lot more articles by men going, "Hey, this behavior is not." cool and not acceptable which is actually the opposite of anonymity no i guess well, and that's no, the that's, thing that's it's, fair too. it's it's and that's kind of the is the pushback against anonymity because on the internet you can make you know you can threaten to rape somebody and they'll ban your account and then you just make a new one and then you come back on and you do it again and maybe you think it's funny or maybe you think that that's making you powerful or something well, I, but, again, I didn't really want to get into this argument, but part of the anonymity is that, like, when someone is uh, espousing their opinion on the internet, like, whether that affects you or not has nothing to do with how old they are. Because someone yeah. far younger than you could be wiser than you, but in real life, you'd be like, you're 12. You don't know what you're talking about. Well, but and the, the and anonymity what I'm makes it, is, like, sink in in a different way. I feel that the conversations that are happening now because of the internet couldn't have happened back then because, or in a different generation because the conversation would be smaller. Well, and also that like the only people you talk to are you're going to be your family and the people in your small town that probably have a lot of similar there's beliefs. A, to there's you. there is a lot a lot a lot a lot of debate mm-hmm. about how much you know there are there are, are internet evangelists, right? Lessig and a bunch of those guys who talk about the democratizing power of the internet. You as a gay, you know, 
14 year old guy in bumfuck Mississippi now actually know that there are other gay 14 year olds out there and now you may actually not blow your brains out because the right. internet helps prove to you that you are not some you know weirdly sinful you know right, horrible yeah. person that you're not alone that you're not alone um, however, there's also some interesting studies that show that people tend to congregate to like. So all of the 18 to 35 white hetero comic book guys will all end up on the same website and basically be like, big or bad. And that's where the anonymity thing also throws in this dash of kind of like, it can be problematic because how many of them are people who are trolling, beca- you know, are trolling and how come and not why, right. which is why I think now you see a strong pushback with people saying, this is my name and this is my opinion. I have an yeah. outlet and you're going to listen to it, right? Like a lot of comic creators didn't get in trouble when the internet started. They got in trouble when Twitter started yeah. because now there was a very visceral, immediate lack of anonymity that a bunch of people could respond to instantaneously. Yes. So now when you get online and are David Goyen are like, she hulks a male power fantasy for Hulk to fuck everybody on the internet can tell you within 30 seconds you are fucking wrong yeah. right and they can attach a name to it so right. it's like it's not to say that like anonymity has its value but i think it's a it's it's a pretty big soupy mess that would take a lot of work to oh, yeah. i think you're right i think there's a lot of cross uh pollination and, and and discourse across generational socioeconomic i mean it's not just age it's also class status oh, yeah, sure. country sure. Well, sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Think there's, there's, also there's a lot of there like, but it's not like, all a, a well articulated and thought out statement in response to somebody's stance on something will is a always well, be ignored, and, and that's that's the point. It's like you have to yell. people that are going, people that <laughs> <laughs> say, uh, look at who, look at the group of people that are espousing this opinion about yeah. calm, like conversation, right? Hey, that's but like, you, man, you do what you need to do. You man. will find a reason to dis. You will find a reason why you are disagreeing with somebody who's just said something that you don't like. Normally, in this instance, I find because it points a finger at a behavior that you are exhibiting, whether it be intent, whether that behavior is exhibited intentionally or not, right? And I think in a lot of cases, it's not necessarily. Sure. You will find a reason to disagree with that person to justify. It's hard to distance yourself from the stuff that you like. So when you're like, man, this comic book is my favorite comic book in the world. And someone brings up a point that's like, you know, it's like actually super racist and sexist. And you're like, but I still love it. So you're wrong. Like, it's hard to distance yourself from stuff and go, yeah, I acknowledge the fact that there are problems in here. Well, and like, you, it has issues. Well, and it, the other the other problem that I think you run into when you get into these large scale conversations is that everybody has different backgrounds, right? Yep. Different levels to which they want to see things amended, resisted, edited, mm-hmm. changed. There are some people who are like, any book that shows racism should be destroyed because it perpetuates a negative idea. Yeah. But that may be from a person who grew up in a place in America or any other country where racism is so pervasive it is like the most cankerous, disgusting societal thing that basically forces all. Good good people who just want to survive into like some sort of self-loathing rotting hell of disdain i mean and then there could be people who grew up you know on the west coast in a multicultural (laughs) society where it's just kind of laid back and they went to a you know a high school where everybody got along and so when that person's like well yeah that's kind of racist but you know what like as long as we don't do it moving forward i think we're going to be okay i mean this is one of the giant problems that you see within Native rights, reparation. Oh, yeah. I mean, Taha Nisi Coates and his whole thing about reparations caused people to just lose their hair to the mm-hmm. lit on fire because everybody from within the African American community and the expat community who are not African Americans but are still black. And I mean, crazy stuff. I watched a great documentary about it was for uh, British black comic artists. And they were talking about how why would you ever change the race? Or the sex of a comic book character. We understand. We know what that they were white. So why change them? It doesn't do anything for us. Help us create more positive things. Yeah. But I had just read an article from an African American comic writer that basically was completely flying in the face of that. So the 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 problem with the internet on the other side of the fence is that then you get everybody colliding about the level of which and how fast is not fast enough or too fast or too much or not enough and yeah. it's hard. It's just. Oh no! Does intention matter? Game. Like well, that yeah, constantly, I mean, right? I mean, I I agree. I think it's hard to distance yourself from the stuff that you love, and I think that it's also just hard to like come to any kind of consensus with absolutely. such a large body of discussion. Oh sure, well, like uh, you yeah. minute you take five people in a room and have them discuss an idea, and you're like, great, cool, we all came up with a compromise, and compound right. that to five hundred, you're like, there's no way. 
Three hundred and fifty million people across yeah, one of the that's... largest nations on earth. Yeah, no. we're, we're yeah, always we, going to agree. We got yeah. it. In, a, in a room with five people, you're going to five find six opinions. Oh, definitely. So, how many opinions are there going to be in an internet of three and a half billion people? I don't know, Joe. You're a mathematician. <laughs> this is Hang there on. are branches of math <laughs> that are are dedicated to this kind of thing, and the people really that study them live math. in insane asylums. I'm just yeah. going to say that. Uh, I think that it is. It's. I, I think that we're even at the point, I, I mean, there is always somebody that is clouding the issue. There is always somebody that's going to come on to a, 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 a thread that's about why we need feminism and go, well, why not human rights? And there's always going to be somebody that says, well, when you say that, you're trying to silence women. There's always going to be somebody that's like willing that that to be heard will claim offense and cloud the issues that we really need to be talking about because attention feels good. There's always, and for every 10 people that do that, there's always one people that one person that's being incredibly sincere with their experience and wants Mm -hmm. and really does have a a root issue. And that's like, we're living in an age of offense where somehow it's like you wear it like mystical armor and it protects you from things and people can't. And then there's like the offense people. And then there's the first amendment people and the first amendment people think that you can say anything you want and you should never have to suffer repercussions from that. I think that it's like, and that's why my personal take on it, for what it's worth, is you have to concentrate, like, calling out the problem, I think, is still paramount. Talking about what is not acceptable behavior. I don't know how to fix it. I do know, though, if we keep talking about it, if we keep calling people out on it and explaining why it's a problem, we're eventually going to hit a point where... More people than not are on the same page. And once more people than not are on the same page, we can start talking about shit. <laughs> we can start talking about things. I, I was shaking my head during that. I time. have to believe that. I have to believe that because my 12-year-old no, I, I is going you. out into the fucking world and yeah. she's going to be a, she's already assaulted on all sides about who she should be and what she should look like and how she should act and blah, blah, blah. And like, I can't face that down. Yeah. So I have to believe that if I'm vocal enough about this and the people that I know are vocal about this, that eventually something will change and it will change in a better way. Yeah, it's true. I mean, we all just die in the end anyway. Yeah. I mean, in the end, yeah. (laughs) I mean, we all, we, you know, there's 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 no recommendations. We're just done. We we all die. Who cares? See you next week. Podcast over. (laughs) The ultimate comfort to me is the fact that at the end, the cold embrace of death waits for me. (laughs) And then it will just be blackness and everything will be over. Well, then I I get to go to the land of the dead and fight alongside Captain America. You think you you get to go to black people heaven, Joe? Yeah. No. No. No, clearly. I do uh, actually. Gordon, I'm just I waiting. do not condone this. I'm much. waiting for the respawn. That's all I'm. That's all <laughs> I'm in it for. I'd be so pissed. Uh, <laughs> he just starts all over. I have to do this shit again. I, oh my yeah, God. Do you get to keep the knowledge? You get, no. Yeah. You get to start all over with nothing. Oh, oh, I guess I would hate this game. No, it would be the <laughs> checkpoint at the worst part of the game. You'd just be like, I have to do this shit again? Uh, no. But I really really... want to go back to the ammo drop before the door closes. The the accidental quick save right before the boss eats you. Or the point where you have to do a thing in a game where you can't not take damage, but that damage will kill you, but the save point is such that there's no way for you to get more health. So you are stuck only being able and to die, I'm, I'm Grant. I'm the kind of person that when I get oh angry God. at a video game, <laughs> I will kill the character I'm playing at repeatedly until my anger reaches... I'm, I'm like, referencing specifically a, a game that Brant was playing. I think it was uh, Prince of Persia, oh, where yeah. the save point, he only had a little bit of life, and there was a thing where he had to take damage, and he couldn't get past it, oh, and so he just stopped few. playing the game and never beat it. I went back eventually. Prince of Persia is the only game I have ever rage quit. But I, there was more that I wanted to say about Universe yes. X, and then I think we should go to recommendations. Continue. You can't talk. We've moved off. We've we are the digre- we are view from the digression. No, no. I refuse to We're believe now that. We're talking about rocket cars. Um, no, I, I <laughs> having this being the second time that I was reading it, uh, I I w- noticed very distinctly how many references they make to the devil early on Mm -hmm. you know devils and adversaries and merlin being the son of the devil like they're giving you hints a lot through the early part of the series about what's going to go on later 
And I also noticed that throughout their conversations, Kyle Richmond was dropping hints to Isaac that he knew what was going to happen. Oh, yeah. uh, and the one that I pulled up specifically was in issue five when they're talking about uh, the Psycho Man and the Microverse and like all the shit that was going on. And Isaac says how terrible. And Kyle just says, betrayal is everywhere, isn't it, Isaac? Like, and it was, there were a lot of references like that, like very subtle things that he knows. And he's known throughout the entire story what was going to happen that Isaac was going to betray him. And I, I got this really, you know. He knew that he was um, one of the chess pieces. Yeah, melancholy sense. That's cool. I, it, it's the minute I finished reading this, I was like, I want to reread it because I know I missed so oh, many yeah, references no. yeah. at the like, end. Like this being the first time I read it, I was just reading it to soak as much in as I could. And the next time I read it, it's going to be that kind of like, oh, let's try to find all the and little And you'll have forgotten everything. I will. I, I also did love well that they about. managed to sneak in a Power Pack reference. Oh, did they? What, yeah. what Power Pack reference? When Marvel and Captain America get the cloak from Dagger, uh-huh. the guys who are hassling her are the some of the kids from Power Pack. Oh, that's great. Yeah. That's, like, a, that's such a good scene. And the only way that you know are the names, and one of them, like, in the background of one panel, you can see the Power Pack outfit. Oh, that's great. I love that scene. I love him wearing cloaks cloak and, and like, how I, I really love the whole thing where marvel is both alive and dead yeah. yeah and in two places at once that story mechanism really worked for me yeah and just like we don't see dagger again she doesn't show up in the no egg. she she like she just disintegrates kind of like, or ascends just, or something yeah i liked it i mean she could have easily been at the end in the multi in the death fight in the multiverse or I whatever. I think you see her again in Paradise X. My mm. memory's a little fuzzy. But uh, I just thought that was a cool moment. She's like, she let go of what was kind of holding her yeah. to the earth and just was like, now it's time for me to take off. Well, I think that, you know, the, the Marvel thing falls into a really good, that, that same thing we've been talking about, at least I've talked about, about like really novel ways of expressing concepts from the universe. Because Captain Marvel, in all of his incarnations has had the power not the power cosmic that's doom uh, um but uh um i can't remember what the it's called the cosmic consciousness the cosmic consciousness and of course it gets played up to some hilarity in the peter david uh, uh captain marvel series because genus vel can see things in tandem with rick but uh it's one of those concepts that you know it's been deployed to varying levels of of interesting but I think it's great to be like, this is a being who exists at a level of consciousness that you cannot comprehend. But here's a good, here's a good, you know, hook to hang that yeah. attempting to understand on. He's so conscious that he can exist in two places and, and basically move two bodies independently of each other at the same time. Well, That's like, a lot of consciousness. Yeah. And I love that they're like, why don't you get this? Why don't you get this? And he's like, no, I have to do it in this way. And at the end, they're like, take your eyes back. You'll have your whole... Con-. And he's like, no, the minute I gain that, death will be able to see me, and the gig is up. And I liked how they... That wasn't something you had to take on faith. Like, they were they were like... And yeah, this I love the, the whole thing. thing with Mephisto. Like, he doesn't want the eyes because he will see too much. Yeah. yeah. And, um, like, his existence is predicated on lies. Right. Like, he is a lie. And if he sees that he's a lie, he'll stop existing. I liked that. That was cool. That yeah. That was a good moment. Like, there's I a do, lot of great stuff I in do this book. Really if you can like find it. The, um, I like the the whole, like, going around to get stuff thing. I just want that to be a mechanic in a video game where you're just, like, trying to steal all the stuff before the hero can get there. It's like Link opens the chest and it's like, yeah, somebody was already here, buddy. He's taking all the stuff back. In a video game. Well, no, but you play as the guy <laughs> oh. that takes all the stuff. <laughs> Yet another great video game design from me. They're so good. They're all good. Sure. They're not. They're terrible. I know it. It's okay. So do you want to <laughs> I mean, move on to recommendations? They're purposefully bad. God, it is. So we're recording this, and I. it is so fucking We are in the in middle here. of Havana. We are yeah, recording like, from Tropical Olympia. I feel yeah. like we should have the big, like, broadly like broad bladed fans spinning lazily i feel like i should be drinking like 
a caparana or earlier like a when you were fanning yourself, I wanted to ask you if you had a case of the vapors. I'm, I have the fucking vapors. Yes. I've had, I need a mint julep and a white linen say, suit. And I've I had four mint juleps food. already. I'll do, I'll do declare. <laughs> it is a frightful heat in here. <laughs> it's a frightful heat in here. I need to be watching some fucking horses like being worked out in front of me and shit. I am. Whenever hot. I hear that voice, all I can think of is Alton Brown doing that voice. <laughs> when he like has that like alternative character that cooks Southern cooking. Oh, yes. Uh, Alton Brown. Oh, good eats. Okay, so right. I'll go first for recommendations. Yeah, go for it, kid. Because it's related to this book. So is it Paradise X? <laughs> it say. is. <laughs> no, next. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so to start out a, a story, um, when we picked Universe X, I was, I was like, okay, I'm going to read Earth X first. I finished it yesterday and read all of Universe X in one day. Oh my god, how are you conscious? Yeah, really. It, I did. I read it today as well. It was it was hard, but I want more. So this is probably a throwaway recommendation because I doubt you guys are going to vote for it. But just in case you do, I want us to talk about Paradise X. I want to read it. We we should definitely do it at some point. It, yeah, but <laughs> I'm point. sorry, not this week. Uh, too uh, too next year. soon. Hmm. Too soon. Too yeah. soon. Yeah. Who wants... I mean, I I totally will probably read it soon, just because while Universe X is sort of fresh in my <laughs> mind, I don't want to have to read it again later. I, yeah. I have to look at it to make sure that it's any good, but I, I happened to notice when I was when I was reading one of my Wikipedia articles, there is a reading companion for this series yeah. that's available on Amazon. I, I noticed know that as well. I, yeah, I'd be interested in checking I, that out. I would read it, except between... The, the regular show, the long run, the special series that Joe and I are talking about doing. It's a secret. I'm also reading ga- the Game of Thrones books. Like, I just have way too much on my table. I just started running a fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons game that's taking up time now. It's oh, just like, man. basic. It's too fucking much. No, it's basic. That, that, that document's not even long enough to fill a book. So, boo freakity hoo for you. <laughs> <laughs> I have too many special projects. So. What, what uh. I'm saying is that there is no way on earth that I'm sitting down yeah. there. Tackle Paradise Earth or Par- Paradise X next. Yeah, it's too much. Um, Can't do it. I'll. I want Brand to go next because I already kn- I saw what he had. And I <laughs> already peaked. know what I'm voting for. You peaked. You, you don't know what I'm bringing. Out. I I know what it is. I brought uh, formerly known as the Justice League by yeah. Keith Giffen and J M Demetrius. 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 I think drawn by Kevin McGuire, inked by Joe Rubenstein. Uh, I didn't catch the original Justice League international run back in the day. Um, so this book was just kind of an awesome revelation. You can have superheroes and you can have them do superhero things and it can be hilarious. And this series is hilarious, at least it is to me. Um, but it's about the band getting back together with hot, awesome characters like Blue Beetle and Captain Nova and, or Captain Adam, excuse me. Oh, yeah. Um, Elongated Man, Mary Marvel, and so on, forming a new version of the Justice League, except not really, because it's very low rent. And uh, Power Girl, too, right? No. No, oh. she's not. No, she's... She's in the next one, thing. then. Is yeah, she character? shows up at one point, I believe. Is there a, a character named Captain Nova anywhere? Yes. I'm, uh, I mean, no. I'm sure in the Nova Corps, someone there's has the rank the Captain. captain <laughs> and Nova. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's Nova, and there's there's lots of captains, can but the, I don't know that there's a Captain Nova. Can the Nova Corps, do they have ranks? Is yes, they like, do, but they're not. The Tenet, Centurion, Nova, blah, blah, blah. Sergeant Nova. No. Or, the Nova Corps is kind of Private not, Nova. No. Private Nova. <laughs> not a thing so much these Corporal days. Corporal Nova. Although, with the Guardians of the Galaxy movie coming back, I'm assuming they'll probably make the Nova Corps a thing. I mean, they're in it. They're uh, no, in the, the trailer. the Nova Corps is a thing. What? The Nova, Nova Corps is in the trailer. Yeah, no, they're in the movie. I'm saying that they will oh. be a thing in the comics again, since yeah, they oh, haven't yeah, yeah, been yeah. recently. Well, the rumor Who right knows? now that's been going around is that Richard Ryder's coming back in Guardians of the Galaxy, the series, because he's maybe a cameo in the movie. All of that's rumor and hearsay. It's so all take rumor. It, take it for what it is, but that's what I've been hearing. For there is around. a Captain Nova. Captain America becomes Captain Nova when he fights Batman, who becomes Green Lantern. <laughs> Captain Nova Whoa. versus Bat Lantern. Bat Turn. <laughs> oh, 
Okay. Is that Dane amalgam? Bain like, what is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's amalgam? Okay. Yeah, uh, I was just amalgam. about to it's... say, this sounds awesome, and why haven't I read it? Uh, uh, let's see. Toby, you should know this one, then. I'm disappointed. I have actually, I haven't even read all of the amalgam no, books. No, because the Iron Lantern. They the actually. Iron Lantern was the Green Lantern Iron Man mashup. They, they released 12 amalgam one shots. Before they wrapped up the, oh, no, the this series, is, <laughs> and then so later the they internet. did another twelve. <laughs> is this a fan fiction that you've Well, it's like a, a comicvine dot com did like a like a battle series. Oh, so I think they emerged two two separate instances. I do believe there's an instant where Captain America becomes a Nova, and there is an incident mm. where Batman becomes yeah, a Lantern. Definitely, uh, Joe, you pitched that night. two yeah. weeks ago. So I think they, they they they. Yeah, so there is a Captain Nova. Captain America does become Nova. I'm not yeah. sure when that happens. Though. Oh, question. I had this question the other day. When is it that Captain America has the, like, laser shield? That's... He has that when he's at the very beginning of Avengers Forever. He has the laser shield. Which what is during the secret... The, the secret but war. But he has a different war. code name when he has it, right? Well, he becomes Nomad. So there's this whole... There's this whole series... Where basically it turns out that the American government has been taken over by somebody. I can't remember who. It's not who you think. It's not like the Red Skull or anything Is it else. the Secret Empire? Probably yeah, Secret right. Empire. That's the one. And so at the end of that, he's like, America is no longer what I believe it to be. I will be Captain America no more. Oh, that's right. And he takes on the Nomad moniker, I believe. And then, of course, later someone else takes on the Nomad moniker. But is I that thought when that, he gets I thought that was when ship? he just became the captain. Well, I but in any, in any case, he also has the laser shield later no on one when can he give is. Me a straight answer on this. In the I've heroic like age, when he is people. Steve Rogers, director of Shield, yeah. he also has the laser well, shield. He at goes, that point, when Bucky is Captain America, he goes and gets it out of storage. Yeah, though. he has it at multiple times. Because <laughs> I don't know point, when he originally got right. it. I'm sorry, I don't. I, I need someone write me at Chard at View from the Gutters because no one ever emails me. <laughs> and how do you spell your name? C H A R D. It's on the website, and uh, tell me when what his code name was when he had the laser shield. Sure I, was no is there anything else that you wanted to say about Justice League, Brent? Sorry, I interrupted. It's hilarious. It's fun. We should read it. Okay. Obscure DC characters. Hurrah! Well, not yeah. that obscure. Second well, tier. It plays with my, well, they're my obscure now. Justice League runs, so. But you can borrow, Brent, if you want. Hmm. I have. Yeah, that JLI stuff's fun. Yeah, that's super fun. Toby, what would you like to read? Uh, so I'm going to pitch two volumes of a mm. series. Uh, so during Fear Itself, they relaunched Journey into Mystery, Ooh. which was Thor's original title. Oh, yeah. And during that time, it starred Kid Loki. Mm-hmm. And it ran for like 30 issues. And then that ended. And that was re- being written by Kerry and Gillen. Mm-hmm. After Kid Loki left the series... Journey into Mystery continued for 10 more issues as Journey into Mystery featuring Sif, written by Catherine Immerman and drawn by uh, Valerio Shidi. And so I am pitching Journey into Mystery featuring, featuring Sif, Stronger Than Monsters, and Seeds of Destruction, which are five issues each. And it's basically two short stories about Sif, one with her like running around doing Asgardian shit, and the other with her hanging out with Beta Ray Bill and having an adventure in space. Which is sort of a continuation of Walter Simonson's, uh, like, the first meeting of Sif and Beta Ray Bill that we read on a previous episode. Yeah. They're, no, they're bros. Yeah, they're super uh, bros. So yeah, so it's a couple of short, fun stories. The art is great. Yeah. The writing's really snappy. I love them both. And I think it would be a nice... Uh, palate cleanser after the dead weight that is universe x and so many people missed that yeah because it stopped being kid loki like people just fucking stopped reading yeah well i mean that's why it got canceled after 10 issues yeah the sales just dropped it continued to be very good though it was super good joe what have you got for us this week i brought the something that i don't know that has been pitched before Mm mm-hmm and I was kind of at a loss. Um, I was saved by Mike Mignola. Oh. I brought the first two trades of Hellboy, uh, Seeds of Destruction and Wake the Devil, um, because largely for the same reason, I wanted something we could read to have fun with. Um, and this nails it. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's not a happy story. but it's Well, I don't think it's necessarily a sad story either. It's very like... Uh, 
Hellboy is a great character. He's kind of he's not quite bumbling. He's capable, but normally in over his head, and mm-hmm. he's very Conan esque. Yeah, yeah, I was just is. gonna say that yeah, because he is. survives because he's stronger than stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Like, as a demon thing, and it's also a huge rip off of Atomic Robo. Oh yeah. And <laughs> sure. totally, 15 the, years before this is that. This the sound yep. of me not rising to the bait. Um, um, it is worthy to note, though, that I was talking to Chris the other day, who's a huge BPRD fan, and he says if you're going to read BPRD, that you should read Hellboy Trades 1, 2, and 9. So this is a good start if you're looking yeah, to jump in absolutely. on BPRD is the first two trades of Hellboy. Yeah, this gives you the background. Um, is that the current BPRD series? Yes. Where BPRD starts uh, is after events that took place in Hellboy 9. There's like a okay. big character revelation in there. So 9 is essential reading as our trades 1 and 2 of Hellboy. But the rest of the series, although good, is not essential for stuff that happens in BPRD. Isn't, Just as a note to people. Isn't Hellboy's life told like fairly out of order in the trades? Like, yes. It's not happening chronologically. No. Yeah, there's definitely yeah. flashbacks, as is BPRD. There's stuff okay. that's like, hey, this is present time, and hey, this is 1949. Yeah, it gets and, disjointing hey, is... to hand Hellboy trades to people because right. like Conqueror Worm happens, I think, before a bunch of stuff in the first yeah. couple of trades, but it's like trade five, and you're just like, what, what? It's, and they're not marked. Like I, right. don't, I think you have to pay attention to the years, maybe, if they even yeah. give them. Some of them give them, some of them don't. <laughs> and it's similar to Conan, how like the first time it was written, it was written out of order because it was like, oh, I have this idea of a story I need to tell, but right. wait, these people need to be there, so I'll set it before that other thing. And oh, it gets super complicated. I checked this. So, yes, when Captain America leaves... Because of the uh-huh. Secret Empire stuff, he becomes Nomad. And when he becomes Nomad, he's in exile. That's when he picks up the energy shield. Sweet. Cool. Thanks, US everybody. Agent has another copy of it. And then, of course, he's given a new one when he becomes Nick Fury. U.S. Agent. That's what I was thinking of. Yeah. Yeah, that's oh. the guy. Okay. Because the one episode... The, I had an issue of Avengers West Coast, which is where U.S. Agent went. Because that's where you went if the Avengers... If, and if you were the best like, character ever. Well, we can't really deny you... Like entry into the Avengers because you're kind of handy to have around. We're gonna just send you like Wonder Man's out there. You just go out there with him. Hang out with this is before they came up with the fifty states initiative. Yeah, and so you can hang out with Wonder Man and Goliath. uh, Yeah, and the thing the thing I always remember is Spider Man. At one point. (laughs) Uh, Spider Man was on the West Coast Avengers. Yeah, yes. yeah, he was. What? And was, Beast. What? And Beast. That's right. Uh, yeah. What? <laughs> at one it made point, sense. U.S. <laughs> agent is going to is like Captain America. You're a jerk. Well, I'm gonna fight you, which is a fight he very clearly would have lost. But Iron Man steps in between him and goes, "Not here. Not now. Not ever." And I was like, "Wow, well, well, Iron Man's kind of cool." I'm going to take him out in a decade from cool. now. Yeah. Iron Man's very cool. Well, dude, I was like 15, all right? Yeah, yeah, Iron Man wasn't cool until Robert Downey Jr. did him a I big did. PR oh, boost. Oh, come on. But uh, <laughs> He was cool. Yeah, so he, was, yeah he was all right. Well, he was always like fucking off and going crazy and then being replaced with his teenage alternate self. That's yeah, true. That and being drunk cool. a lot. Like, he has no, he a long, a that's long he history. All of that's cool. He has a long history of going way too far. And then that Marvel editorial, like, having to walk it back somehow and yeah. make him, like, a reasonable hero again. Look, My we f- know you want this to become a teenage manga about androids and robot suits, but uh, we got to rein this in. Anyway, yeah, Char- I just feel like the rest of the Avengers are like, Tony, 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 <laughs> settle it down, man. <laughs> Chill the fuck out. Chard, man. what did you bring this week? Oh, oh man, I'm, so I brought two there. books, and I have not yet picked which one I'm going to pick. Well, so. well, you have two seconds. Go. Okay. Um, I'm going to bring two trades of a book that have been recommended before, but only the first trade was out at that time. There are Ooh. now nine issues of this series out now. It is a dystopian Thank you. <laughs> fruitopia future. And <laughs> it, it's a dystopia ruled by fruit. It's actually ruled by corporations. So much like... Uh, I think I know what this is. Yeah, many dystopian futures. Uh, this is basically... Um, this is Greg Rucka's Lazarus. Yeah. And this is a future in which mega corporations have... Uh, they have family names because they were originally just like family corporations, but now they are mega corporations. So the family is the most important part of the corporation. The 
people in the country that is the U.S. is broken up into there's family and then there's like staff and then there's waste. And so the people that work for the company are like the staff or they have a different name that I can't remember right now. But uh, so they're like the second most important people. And it, it'll show you the population of a town. It'll be like family, two, uh, staff, like 100, waste, like 400,000. And uh, it just goes to show like the inequity between the very wealthy and the very poor has grown in the future. And because of that, in the future, in the future. <laughs> <laughs> and because of that, every family has its bodyguards. They have their kind of immortal, maybe cyborg, maybe super powered, maybe <laughs> uh, bodyguards that are there to protect the family. And there's kind of maybe? with this one. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the bodyguard for the Carlisle family, which is the family that the book revolves around, is uh, – her name is Forever, uh, I believe. I haven't read it yet. Oh. I keep looking at Toby like he knows what I'm talking about. No, uh, I it, want it, to read it. I believe it. it's Forever. I just have not gotten okay. to it yet. Yeah, it's, her name's Forever, and there's a kind of intrigue going on of like, oh, were you manipulated as a child? Are you actually part of this family? What's going on? Remember, you're training. So there's lots of cool flashbacks to her being like a tiny girl ninja. And then, like, present day stuff where she's a badass security officer bodyguard to Ninja. the Carlisle family. Ninja, still. Um, Written by Greg Rucka, you say. Yeah. Do go on. It's Greg Rucka, and uh, who does the art on this? I've just Is it Lark? totally forgotten. I, it may, it's probably Lark. I have it in front of me. Hang on a sec. Uh, Lettering and extras by yes. Eric Trotman. Yes, Lark. And then, yes, Eric Chapman does all the back matter in this book, which is yeah. phenomenal information what? about the family and hilarious ads. And doesn't he design, like, all the family crests? Yes, yeah, he did all the crests. He does all the digital layouts on the displays, on the monitors and yeah. stuff. But I was... Um, I don't know if I've ever talked about this on the show, but Eric Troutman used to be my boss, and I was his intern for a while. But anyway, he uh, he makes all these fake ads, and every week when I see them, I always have to like go up to him and be like, "What, dude, what are you doing? Like, I thought this was a Russian credit card ad on the back of this comic. They're so convincing, and they're hilarious, and I love them. And all the fine print is like stuff you'd read straight out of ads. But I'm much a little funnier. angry right now. Why? Did because they take him out of the trades? I didn't know number nine was out. Oh, yeah. I've been I, waiting for it, I guess, for like six weeks now. I, I How is it, it two came trades out? if there's only nine okay. issues? So each trade is only four issues, and the ninth right. issue is the one after the trade, um, which means that the $10 first issue of the trade is actually more expensive than the cover price of the single issues. But that's where those arcs end. They're However, arcs, right? the first trade does have... A small issue that was never printed in the single issues. Yeah, it has more bonus material, and it's still a good deal, especially since you cannot find... Is that specifically the digital version? No. Where the trade is cheaper? Or, or the trade is more expensive? No, it's both. Weird. Because the print is... First trade's 10 bucks. So, right. But if there's um, four issues, those issues would have to be 250 each. Oh, I, yeah, I guess you're right, my man. But I know the digital that, copies, so. like... Yeah, the four issues are ninety nine cents each, and then the digital trade well, is like and the first five issue bucks is or something. free now too. So oh, is um, it? so yeah, you can go check that out. In on any case, the it's images website. It's, it's a, a weird thing. pricing, but the price has recently just gone up to three fifty an issue rather than two ninety nine an issue. Anyway, trade nine or issue nine, I believe, came out last week. Um, now that finishes the second arc, story yes. arc. So yeah. why wasn't it printed in the second I trade? Don't know. Okay. And maybe it is in the trade. Oh, okay. And I, the trade is just Because I remember issue out. eight specifically says issue four of five. Yeah. I think that the second trade is coming out soon, but there's enough of the first two trade. The trade, the two first two story arcs are completed. That's what I'm pitching. Fair enough. First two story arcs. It's a great book. It's very good. The art's fantastic. It is Lark, um, and uh, it's good stuff. And I like a futuristic story that isn't like super crazy futuristic sometimes it's just like oh this is maybe believable maybe, maybe. cool so everyone should check that out Cade, what are you voting for <laughs> um, o- outside air. our window someone is screaming something weird too downtown man it's a weird place don't believe it all right Cade, what do you, you're going first. You volunteered, so. Oh, I did. Um, this is a tough choice. Because uh, Justice League is one of my favorite books. Lazarus is one of my favorite books. 
Um, we've been doing a lot of superheroes lately, so I think I'm going to go with Lazarus. Cool. Cool. Brant? But they're funny superheroes. <laughs> That's true. Um, that is true. They the Hellboy. Good. Yes. That. I'm pointing at Joe. Well, clearly, everyone who's listening can see it. <laughs> he was indeed pointing at me. Let the record show. Okay. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Just rip off of a ton of ribbon here in the I... <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I lie out of love. Um, who, I, who went next? I I, it was me, and I'm, yes. I'm very tempted between Lazarus and Hellboy. Not sure which one to pick. Um... I think I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna vote for Hellboy. Yeah, we haven't talked about enough Hellboy. That was also my vote. Oh, good deal. We all right. Even on our Joe, for the record, vote. I will keep my vote to myself at this time. You're eyeing my book. You know, yeah, I would have we clearly You already voted, said you were going to vote for that. I clearly would have voted for <laughs> so I, I voted first. It's, I can't believe it's not the Justice League, or it's, it's uh, formerly known. Formerly as. known. Because this is part of a a trilogy, I think, where there's formerly known as. Can't believe it's not. And I can never remember what the third one is. I don't. A day. Maybe there's only a day two. in the life of the Justice League. That's Pat. Maybe like, there's only two. I think there's only the two because then, of course, they the same team went and did the Defenders. The, yeah, mm-hmm. Defenders, which is which is hilarious. not and quite as funny as you've these. pitched it's that one. Really I have. Right? Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, so for next week, Hellboy volumes one and two. Yes. Yep. Uh, Seed, of, Seed Destruction. of Destruction and Wake the Devil. Yes. Uh, yeah. Even on the video. Interestingly, show. I think I have Hellboy's volumes one, four, and five. Don't know how that happened. Those are fun. Did I give you any of those? (laughs) No. I just somehow picked those up. I don't know. All right. Sweet. All right. Well, more talk about Toby's comic collection next week on (laughs) View from the Gutters. (laughs) Same view time. Same view channel. Thanks, Joe. Same sound channel. Get out of here. Take them away, toys. (laughs) Same audio channel. Bye, everybody. Thank you for listening to me from the gutters. I hope our recommendations have inspired you to go out and find some new comics you'll enjoy. Join us next time for a discussion of our selected title, but like every week, we encourage you to read all of the recommended books. In the meantime, please leave us an iTunes review. It really does help new listeners find the show. You can also like us on Facebook, subscribe to our YouTube, and follow us on Twitter at ViewFRTHGutters. Feel free to email us at contact at ViewFromTheGutters.com. Please send us any questions, comments, or recommendations you might have. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel as we post new videos every week. And thanks again for listening. And as always, keep reading.